What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. Now, it's been a crazy last few days trying to get everything done before draft time, but here we are with the final board of the year. We have the top 60 as usual, and we'll get into detail on all of that, and also have some added labels and context for the tiers that give a little bit more insight into some of the projections you see in the scouting reports. But yeah, be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new, and let's go ahead and get into it. Everyone past about 80 in this group of 110 players is in their separate tier as more of a summer league contract, maybe exhibit 10 guy, but there are still some talented names here overall. And as we get into that 80-ish range, it's more of the players I consider for a two-way. They may not be the first choice, but bigs like Drew Timmy, Oscar Shibwe, and Charles Bediaco are very much in the mix. Ife Obogadi too, pending the knee injury. You've got wings like Landers Nali, Armand Franklin, Chris Livingston, and Alex Fudge. And the last two not being born in 2000, like 90% of everybody on this list does give them some added appeal. And then in the 60 to 70 range, these would be more of the players I'd value most for a two-way and maybe a stash spot for some of the international guys. And this tier continues for the first several guys inside the top 60. I think Caleb McConnell showed quite a bit to like defensively at Rutgers, kind of still looking for a consistent spot on offense. Adam Flagler and Isaiah Wong are actually draftable to me in the end of round two. And then other guards like Serge Jabari Rice, Jalen Pickett, and Demoy Hodge intrigue as potential two ways too. There's a lot of other names we could go into detail on and this could almost be its own separate video, but that's where I see this group of players who won't likely get drafted beyond a few of them, but are still worthy of being in the conversation. Wichita State's Craig Porter Jr. has been a late season riser for me through the pre-draft process and has a whole lot of game. I kind of wrote him off earlier in the year, but you really won't find as many guards as well-rounded and with the creativity off the dribble that he has. He is older and not the biggest, but I found myself just liking his game significantly more than most other prospects in this area, and that starts to matter a lot more at this point. A rare Ivy League prospect, Tosan Awoma, is a 6'8 forward with a plus wingspan that can really pass it, and his high feel and skill level make him a real second round target, and someone I think a smart team is going to bring in in the front court. I like taking a chance on my Javi Kings game as a 6'5 wing who has a lot of potential playing off ball and competes defensively. He's another guy who's going to have to be more consistent as a three point shooter, and we've been waiting on that, but I think there's a rotational player in there, best case. Colin Castleton comes in at 57. He may not wow you in any one area, but his defensive technique, his passing acumen, and overall productivity averaging about 16, 8, and 3 blocks the last couple years make him a draftable prospect and someone I think could sneak his way into a guaranteed deal in the next two seasons. It's hard to really lose in these parts of the draft, so I think taking a chance on a Mighty Bates could end up being worth it. There are reasons to be lower on him from the defense, the decision making, the frame, but a potentially great shooter at 6'9", I'd be willing to take a swing on his talent level and molding his game into a contributor, and if it doesn't work out, you're okay with it. Hunter Tyson has a lot of appeal as a big time shooter with good size and the ability to finish well around the rim. He's older too, but he fits well into team settings. I question his defense some, but teams in need of shooting, whether that be in the late 40s and 50s or into the undrafted market, Tyson just has to be a top target. Like we mentioned before, this tier is part of that last group I'd consider as two ways and priority undrafted guys. Most of them are relatively older, but have some really intriguing skills in specific areas, and I think could end up being gems if things turn in their favor. A rangy athlete who made significant improvements as a sophomore, Mo Gay has some real second round appeal as a project pick that could turn into a real piece in time. He's certainly worth a late round pick and hopefully lands in a good situation for his development. Even with Keontae Johnson being just 6'5 and an older prospect, I think he's worth a late second round look as a physical wing with a 7 foot wingspan that has improved as a shooter and can finish above the rim. As long as him being medically cleared remains the case, he belongs here and unless there's something that I don't know, him being taken off of almost every board everywhere has been kind of weird to see. It was hard not to like Jordan Miller's energy and versatility defensively along with the ability to knock down a shot, mix it up as a cutter and do work on the glass. He's got a chance to carve out a role which is what we're looking for at this point and I wouldn't be surprised if he makes a great impression at Summer League. I like Jalen Wilson's will and ability to take on that bigger role and produce at a high level at Kansas this year, but I just don't know what his elite or great skill is. He's decent at a lot of things and maybe he just looks a lot better back in that lower usage role, but I think mid to late second feels like the best range for him. 
Jalen Clark's defensive abilities and offensive improvement made him a real draft prospect this year. Now the Achilles injury makes him a much tougher prospect to rank, especially from this distance, but I think he did enough to still be on the board and he would have been higher if he was healthy. Tumani Kamara popped when watching for Deron Holmes this year and he carried some of that intrigue into the pre-draft process. He's a 6'8 wing that can really guard all over the floor and is a good athlete and I just think what he does makes sense. He'll have to keep growing as a shooter but he seems like a guy, a team like a, a Miami snatches up if he goes undrafted and we'll have him playing 12 minutes in the Eastern Conference semis next year. Jalen Slauson's combination of defensive activity, playmaking prowess, and an improving shot make him a prospect worth drafting in the second round. Now he is a fifth year guy coming out of Furman, which is not exactly the greatest profile or background, but he was incredibly productive, efficient, and has the size to hang at his position. I remain a big fan of Mike Miles' game even with these smaller measurements. Now it's an uphill battle for the smaller guards in the league, but I do think he's dynamic enough offensively and well-rounded enough to be drafted and potentially make an impact in the NBA in the right situation. Ricky Council the Force athleticism, finishing, and self-creation off the dribble make him a solid second round option. Now I was higher on him earlier in the year, but I think the shooting and off-ball questions along with what level he can reach defensively will have a big say in him finding that spot somewhere in the league. Seth Lundy continuing to prove himself as a big time shooter who can defend and has a good athletic profile make him an easy second round bet. He'll have a clear role to play and even as an older player, I think he could return really good value in this range. A 7 footer who can space the floor at a high level and is mobile, Tristan Vucevic should be taken on draft night and considered in the early to mid second. I think teams would have actually been a little more interested had the stash option been something that he was also interested in, but I think there's enough room for him somewhere in the league. I love Kobe Brown's skill set as an oversized wing that really improved in a lot of ways offensively. Now there's always the skepticism in what level of shooter he actually is given the jump in the senior year, but I think there's enough there that makes him a good bet as a contributor and I wouldn't be surprised if he has a team interested in him in the late 20s and early 30s. Jaquavion Smith has been a really tough player to rank down the stretch of the year. I'm a believer in his talent as a microwave scoring combo guard, but there is a lot of difficulty in those guys sticking, especially as slight as he is and without much else beyond the scoring. But at the same time, at a certain point in the draft, I'd be willing to take a chance on his shot making talent. Now I'd say there's a bit of a talent jump here from the previous group and the top few in this tier could be somewhat separated as the most likely to see a partially guaranteed deal in the second round but after that it's a lot of strong two way looks for me whether they get picked or not. Julian Phillips defensive upside and impact at 6'8 along with the priors he has as a shooter keep him in this group of potential NBA contributors. I was actually a little more concerned with the stiffness of some of his movements rather than the shooting or what he looked like within that Tennessee offense but a young potential 3 and D wing prospect with size is pretty self explanatory. Andre Jackson Jr. is about as interesting a player in this draft as there is. He's an upperclassman wing who is really athletic, does all the little things, makes plays for others and defends at a projectably good level, but at the same time he has some really limited avenues for fitting in offensively because of the shooting and without being a true lead guard. But I still think the amount that he affects games and his physical profile keep him an option in this area. Despite some injuries, Ryan Rupert showed enough this year in the NBL, primarily on defense, to make him a late first, early second round prospect. He also received a green room invite, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if he'll be taken in the first at this point, but the defense matched with the hope that he can improve as a shooter would give him a spot in someone's rotation eventually. And at 6'7 with a 7'2 wingspan and a fluid athlete, that's a risk I think you're willing to take. Jordan Walsh is one of the better perimeter defenders in this class and does it at 6'7 with a 7'2 wingspan. The shooting and overall offensive comfort is a work in progress, but he could very well see the floor early in the right situation just because of what he brings defensively, at least in the regular season. He's still a young guy and someone that could be a value pick in this range. 
The reason Jaime Hawkins' stock has risen so significantly everywhere is he's been performing extremely well in all of his workouts, but based on what he showed in college the last several years, I still have questions about where he matches up defensively, his three-point shooting, and in his adjustment to a role that is no longer as a high usage four that often plays on the interior. Now don't get me wrong, he's very skilled and has great feel for the game, and it's not like he can't play, but it would be hard for me to boost him to like 18 or 20 where he might land based off of what I've heard and read rather than what I've actually been able to see. Marcus Sasser is another one of these older but more proven prospects with the ability to fill a role. It's going to be tougher for him given he's a smaller guard, but the shooting, self-creation, and point of attack defense gives him a good skill set to work with, and I could easily see him in a backup role for years down the line. Amari Bailey's abilities as a point of attack defender with good size and the improvements he made as a creator and shooter over the year make him a solid candidate to contribute in the future. He's another player I think is slightly underrated and I would consider him as early as the late first round. You'll find a wide range of opinions on Noah Clowney and I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I think he has the potential to be good defensively in the way that he covers ground, some of the rim protection, and I think he could carve out a role because of that first and foremost. My questions come more offensively in the shot and where he best plays in a lineup at the four or the five, but we start getting to the mid twenties, late thirties, he becomes an easy selection as one of the younger players in the draft and someone who made an impact on a really good team this year. Even as an older player, I think Trace Jackson Davis is a worthy late first round, early second round prospect. Revisiting him recently, the athleticism, rim protection, and improvements as a passer make him someone that's going to contribute. And with the lack of bigs in this class, I could see him going fairly high because of it. I still think Julian Strother is underrated as a 6'7 shooter who can attack a closeout and improved enough defensively over time. We've seen him perform on the biggest stages on some really competitive teams, and if he does indeed fall to the late 40s like a lot of mocks have said, I think that could end up being one of the bigger steals of the draft. Belmont's Ben Shepard has a lot of appeal as a 6'6 wing who can really shoot it in a variety of situations, is solid defensively, and can make a play for himself when necessary. He's older, but he's a good plug and play bet, and someone some teams may prefer over a younger option with more perceived long term upside. Omax Prosper's energy and versatility defensively make him a good role player bet in this range. I think as long as he can continue his trajectory as a shooter, he'll have an important role on a good team. And when we start to get around here, that becomes something I value more than I have at times in the past. James Najee measuring in at 7 foot in shoes with a 7'7 wingspan already at 250 pounds is pretty convincing. I'm not a huge measurements guy but that is legit 5 size and when you combine that with his energy and athleticism it's hard to not see him playing an NBA role in some capacity at some point. He is very raw offensively, not the most polished technically speaking in a lot of other areas but I know what he does and brings to the table and he may end up being a top 25 pick for it. Gigi Jackson has been one of the hardest players to rank in the last several years. He had tremendous moments as a scorer as a young freshman at South Carolina, but the vision for what role he plays in the NBA and his willingness to do that is where I get a little bit more skeptical. He remains a first round talent to me, but some of the upperclassmen with an easier path to a role may lead to him falling on draft night. Xavier's Kobe Jones is another one of those upperclassmen contributor bets in this range. I've been a fan of his playmaking. I'd been a fan of the playmaking and his general will as a winning player, but the shooting improvements matched with the defense make him someone that makes sense as a connecting wing in the league. And I think you look at the success of a guy like Christian Brown this year and have to be excited about what Jones can do. Now this tier was super tough to put in order and I'd consider at least 10 of these guys to be first round grades. There's a lot of value here as high rotational bets with starter upside and I think some of the more established teams will consider them throughout the 20s for that reason. Chris Murray is just a solid first round pick as a 6'9 wing who can make an impact in a few areas. The 3 point shot will swing just how effective he is in a major way. He hasn't been quite the shooter his twin Keegan is but I think he'll be a rotation player and he provides an appealing safeness in that mid to late first round. 
Big Whitehead came into the year as a potential top 5 pick and the foot injury really held him back from showing more of what we've seen from him in the past. A 6'7 wing who proved himself as a shooter and has good measurables defensively has a clear role to a role. Now he'll need to recover some of that athleticism to make a true impact and the injury could swing him several spots on draft night. But I'm comfortable betting on one of the youngest prospects in the draft and one of the most decorated prep players ever figuring it out. CD Sissoko was another one of the more undervalued prospects in the class to me. As a 6'7 wing, I like his combination of athletic tools, the defensive potential, some of the ball skills in his passing and handle, and the flashes that he showed in transition. Now he is still raw, the jumper and half court offense are going to need a lot of improvement, but I think there are enough pieces there to be a first round pick and eventually a legit contributor. Injuries threw off Nick Smith Jr.'s freshman year at Arkansas, but some of the concerns in his ability to get to the bucket, his creativity on the perimeter, and reliance on the floater were always there, so that made evaluating him pretty difficult, but I think dropping him much lower than this could be a little nearsighted given the talent that still exists with him, what he showed prior to, and because of how small a sample it was this year. I've appreciated Brandon Pawzimsi's game a little more down the stretch of the year as one of the best shooters in the draft who also has great feel as a passer and does all the little things to win. Now there still are some concerns in his size and on ball defense though he's great in help, but as an eventual second or third guard he checks a lot of boxes. Max Lewis is often mocked in that late first early second round range but if you watch the channel you know I'm a little higher on him than most at this point. A 6'6 wing with a 7 foot wingspan that can put the ball on the floor in a few ways and has encouraging athletic tools is enough to keep him here despite some of the concerns and how he performed defensively. If you like and value shooting, it's almost impossible not to be a fan of Jordan Hawkins' game. I think it's reasonable to question what he's giving you consistently as a smaller wing beyond the shot, but he has a true elite skill to me that can be weaponized to open up opportunities for others, and he can also be passable defensively, and that combination alone should keep him in a rotation for a long time. 6'8 wings who can shoot it in multiple ways and some off the dribble are difficult to find and that keeps Jet Howard as the top 20 guy for me. There's clear concerns in his defense and the ability to get to and finish around the rim but I'm willing to bet on his skill set and him making progress in a team structure in those areas and I wouldn't at all be surprised if he returned lottery value in 5 years. Leonard Miller is one of the more interesting players in the class and a guy that I've changed my opinion on a couple times, but given his sheer production in the G League this year and his adjustment to being a contributor and more of a big man in defensive role gives me more confidence in him. I'm not sure how much of the guard skills we'll see in the NBA, but it's at least there to explore and at 6'10", his combo of abilities just doesn't come around too often. Jalen Hushafino is a solid guard prospect with good size and the ability to make a play consistently in the pick and roll and defend at a high level. Even with some of the rim pressure or shooting or athletic concerns that may hurt him as a lead guard, I still think he has a couple pathways to being a positive player given his size and I'd be most comfortable picking him anytime after the lottery. Bryce Sensible has seen his stock on the mocks diminish a bit, likely due to his knee surgery at the end of the season and not being able to work out, but I think he's a good enough offensive talent to be considered in the top 20 of the draft even with his defense which was very rough. I'd usually prefer a little more upside in the surrounding parts of his game and his range but that's the type of scoring and shooting talent I think he is and if he falls to the early second, someone is getting an instant steal. Tier 5 has a lot of potential starters and those with a lot of upside. I'd say that yellow line kind of shows who's a little closer to the upcoming tier and those closer to the big tier 6 that we just did. But it's a lot of talent that I'd be willing to bet on post lottery. I'm a believer in Keontae George as an offensive talent and in him becoming a reliable defender, which keeps him in the lottery for me. He didn't shoot it great and had some struggles with injuries down the stretch of the year, but I think there's enough there in multiple parts of his game to be a contributor at the least and really pop if things work out in his favor. Derek Lively's ability to protect the rim at a high level and serve as a lob threat and rim runner give him an easy road to being an important and valuable piece in the NBA. I think the lack of polish and aggression on the inside, the screen setting, you know, things in that realm make it tougher to completely sell him as a top 10 guy, but his stretch run proved his value as someone that could completely change the defense in the future. Kobe Bufkin's well-rounded skill set as a 6'5 guard has gotten him draft buzz as high as the top 10 and seen his stock grow dramatically over the last several months. He's an excellent finisher, a growing playmaker, solid shooter, and a potentially high impact defender. And when you put that with the way that he's able to fill different roles and just make plays, it's easy to see why he has so many fans in lottery front offices. 
Grady Dick has an obvious pathway to be an important NBA contributor. He's a great shooter at 6'7 and has the ability to do other things at a solid level, including defend, and that makes him a lock for the lottery for me. To get into that next tier, I think you'd want a little more self-creation or like elite defense, but it's hard not to like his game and he should make an early impact wherever he ends up. I believe Koulibaly has had one of the more interesting progressions that I've seen from a prospect in the last couple years. He's a 6'8 wing that has great upside defensively and as an athlete, and he's grown exponentially from the junior club to contributing in the playoffs alongside Wemby in a matter of months. It's been crazy to see. Now it's harder for me to commit to the surefire top 10 talk with him too. I just think there's a little too much projection involved with him offensively for me to feel comfortable with it, but there's still an awful lot there with him as a player and he's not as raw as maybe you'd think. And also, I'm really trying to drop his scouting report on draft day. I might not have enough time, but we'll see what happens. Maybe I just drop it the day after. Everyone here has a great chance of delivering as high level starters and maybe fringe all stars. Now, if we're just talking ceilings, Bilal Koulibaly is probably in the next group, so he's right on the borderline. I just have a bit more confidence in the guys that are in there. Now, getting into this next group. A 6'9 forward with the ability to stretch the floor and provide help side rim protection at a high level. Taylor Hendricks appeal is pretty obvious. He's the guy every team is kind of searching for and would like to have in that spot in some way. And despite a lack of creation and playmaking, he's a guy I think will be a star in his NBA role and help teams win a lot of games in the process. I remain high on Case and Wallace for his abilities to defend at a very high level, both on but especially off the ball. He's a capable three-point shooter, a solid playmaker, and can get to the pull-up in the pick and roll, and just has the perfect skill set to be a complimentary guard in the NBA. I understand the hesitations in him maybe not being a primary and taking that this high in the draft, but I think there's a lot of value in what he brings that help you win at a high level, and to me, he belongs here. I've come around more on Anthony Black late in the year. I still have some of those same concerns in the half court offense, but I do think his upside as an all around guard threat that can be special defensively and potentially fill multiple roles all at 6'7 is something that should be highly valued in this range. He'll likely land in a spot that's great for him to develop in as one of the lead ball handlers in a Washington or a Utah. I haven't been a huge fan of the Orlando rumors, but regardless, I'm excited to watch how he grows and what it looks like for him at the NBA level. Juris Walker fits in perfectly as a modern four man at 6'8". He impacts the game defensively as a help side rim protector. He can hold his own on the perimeter, especially against wings, and offensively, I believe quite a bit in his untapped upside as a playmaker and long term as a shooter, making him a shoe in for the top 10. I like his fit in Indiana. I think that would be the best place for him to land, but there's a few good spots he could be really effective in that range. Jairus Walker is a physical 6'8 forward that impacts the game in multiple ways defensively and on offense has an intriguing collection of tools from the playmaking upside to the above the rim finishing and long term shooting. He fits in nicely as a modern 4 man with an impact that could resemble the likes of an Aaron Gordon or a Paul Millsap potentially and that keeps him one of the more prominent prospects in the draft for me. Now we've been with this same sort of group for a while and to me these would be best explained as borderline all-stars that I'm most confident in in my locks for the top 10. Cam Whitmore's stock has kind of dropped leading up to the draft, but I still believe he's a top five talent in this class. There have been rumors about his medicals, some about him just not interviewing well, but I think his combination of athleticism, shot creation potential, and some of the defensive upside on ball make him one of the best options. He's going to have to become a better decision maker and passer and patch up some things on defense, but for me, he's firmly in that next tier outside the top two. Alabama's Brandon Miller is a very good prospect and there's a lot of reasons to be comfortable in what he brings to the table as a 6'9 wing who can shoot it in multiple ways, can make a play off the dribble and defend at a solid level. That's a very difficult thing to mess up in the NBA and it puts him easily in here at number four. Now my hesitations have always been built more around the idea of him being the clear second best prospect in the class. I just think the Tatum Paul George level may be a little tougher for him to accomplish for a few reasons, but I'm comfortable with what he brings to the table and I think he'll have a very successful career. At number three, we have Amin Thompson. 
He's one of the more unique and most interesting prospects we're going to see, especially when you throw in the OTE program and all of this. Now, the reason I value him at three is his dynamic ability to put pressure on a defense, make plays for others, and defend multiple positions at 6'7". I've often thought about the practicality of a man actually getting to some of his highest end outcomes, especially in relation to Brandon Miller reaching his, but I'm staying put with the men's playmaking and unique abilities at this point on the board. Scoot Henderson remains in the number two spot as he has for me all year. I just think his combination of physical tools matched with the tenacity, the skill set, and the performance in the G League as a teenager make him one of the better point guard prospects of the last 10 to 15 years. Of course, he's also not without some stuff that he's going to have to get better at as well, but to me, he's a cut above everyone you would want to put in contention here. Then number one, we have Victor Wembanyama. I don't think we'll fully appreciate it until a few years in the future, the same way it's always fun to look back on the Zion year or whatever else, but it was great to experience Wemby in the moment as he took this massive leap this season and really turned the upside into fully being one of the greatest prospects of all time. He's unlike anyone we've seen and has a real chance to be one of the best to ever do it, which as wild as that sounds and the type of pressure that comes along with saying that, it'd almost be disrespectful if we didn't describe him that way. And here's a look back at the entire board. Tier wise, Vic is in a spot of his own with no number necessary. It's just kind of a given. So for me, Scoot is alone in tier one and then so on from there. If you did enjoy, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new around here and leave a comment down below if some of your favorites in this class or guys are a little higher on than most or myself. I'll have some content coming out post draft for sure. And then we're a little up in the air until we get closer to summer league. I won't lie, I probably need a little basketball cleanse or might need to actually get it back in shape myself in the meantime. But yeah, I'm rambling now. I appreciate y'all for rocking with the channel this year. We've been doing some great numbers and doing some great things. And yeah, as always, I'm Keandre. This is Hoopin' Elect. Until next time, I'm out. I know what I want to do and nothing's going to stop me from doing it. And I always got that in mind. And it doesn't just stop to basketball. You know, it's, it's about life.